Okay, I think we'll get started. Thanks, folks, for joining. There's some people join coming in. Please feel free to sit wherever you like. Uh, thanks for joining this session today um, about balancing productivity that uh, large language models and inference APIs and AI give us with the responsibility of accountability, particularly when it intersects in cloud native. And I'm going to talk to you from my own experience building and submitting a project to CNCF and some of the challenges that that's encountered. So just very quickly, um, oops, there we go. Just very quickly, I am a uh, principal engineer at AWS. Uh, I work in region services, so it's building out regions um, and everything that entails. But you know, that's not really why I'm here today. I think what I'm really here to talk about is the sort of more existential side of things that interest me, which is sort of the rise of artificial intelligence. You know, you get images generated by DALI. You have nonstop conversations about it all through KubeCon. Um, but I think really interestingly, if you ever read Isaac Asimov, if anybody is a, a fan, you, you can sort of see where the world is going. And it's, it's interesting because we've started in the virtual and AI eventually will be making its way to the physical. What's kind of funny is that the reality of that right now is it has very little spatial awareness. It's typically used to regurgitate coding problems and produce bad images. But once you have agents running on top of models and models running on top of models that are, hype, that are tuned to perform to optimize the models beneath them, we'll get to a state where it becomes highly performant and applicable in every walk of life. We've already seen that for the past decade or so where financial models, insurance models have been um, guided by, by ML. And now we're starting to see that this is coming into the physical world where that kind of suite of AI ML is being applicable for things like transportation, security, and healthcare. What's interesting about this as well is that all throughout this KubeCon so far, we've heard about this intersection of um, cloud native and AI. And I would sort of challenge how much do we actually really know about it? I think it's, it's an interesting set of domains to kind of entwine. But if you think about the crowd of machine learning engineers and data scientists versus folks who are typically involved in cloud native, they're a very different uh, type of community and they're very different uh, needs. And so this, um, I think it's Epime Epimetheus is his name, is the, the husband of Pandora here, using the key that Zeus provided to, uh, to unlock Pandora's box. And I think we're kind of getting that, uh, getting towards that point fairly soon. So today I'm going to talk to you about uh, a few things. We're going to discuss uh, kind of the accretion of knowledge to how do we get here today. We'll also be discussing um, the Kate's GPT project. I want to show you sort of what is it about, why did I think it was an interesting idea, and what are some of the challenges uh, from an ethical point of view, but also from a, a community and technical point of view with starting to build some of the first practical cloud native applications with AI. And then we'll end up just discussing briefly kind of where we're going and what does the future look like. So to get started, let's talk about the accretion of knowledge. Well, um, a lot of these projects that you see today um, have been the beneficiaries of hard work for the past 50 years. I'm not going to go through all this in super detail, but when you look at uh, things like DeepMind's convolutional neural network and the capabilities for image processing that that enabled, uh, you look at the announcement of BERT, these two key technologies then en uh, enabled things such as ChatGPT and other services. And so you can see that over the past decade or so, there's been a forward trajectory in terms of how we can get to where we are today into the you know, services we know, such as ChatGPT, I think that that's been really the first exposure the public has had. However, many papers have been published, and I think there's been incremental progress, especially moving over to GPUs as it's to train and to serve. So I think what I wanted to sort of reflect upon here is that we can see that there's some really interesting opportunities with generative AI. You know, it's great at being able to produce images and text and sound. It's even better yet at looking at patterns and recognizing trends within those patterns. And we can perform some prediction. I mean, people from the ML world, this isn't new. You know, you have a dimension with features, you perform a linear regression on it, or you'll run up some other format of regression and you can start to build out fairly accurate models. But I think what's interesting is when you apply technology such as transformers, you're suddenly decreasing the amount of time taken to train. You can reuse models rather than to start from scratch. And you're also starting to enable people to play around with hyper-tuning and waiting. I won't go too much into that side of the house today, other than to say that all of this sort of came out about the time I was working heavily in Kubernetes, and I was experiencing exactly these kind of problems. Looking at patterns that you find in Kubernetes debugging and failure modes, looking at how to translate those complex uh, error logs, event logs, and 
figuring out ways to then predict if there'd be a future failure. So it felt like there was a natural synergy between some of the capabilities and uh, superpowers of generative AI and some of the things I was looking for. So I want to talk a little bit about the esotericism of Kubernetes. Uh, it's a bit of a mouthful, that. Effectively, Kate's is a really interesting uh, system because it's more than just a substrate these days. And this is my little haiku that uh, ChatGPT wrote for me earlier on. And I thought that was quite a, an apt, um, an apt uh, observation. Yeah, fixing is certainly very rare for me. Anecdotally, I remember working at American Express and um, we had HA proxy failures and we were dropping packets and we, we, we narrowed it down to several nodes and it turned out to be that there was a soft IRQ reset uh, that was being caused by various contract issues. And what was funny about that, it was really nothing to do with Kubernetes, but when you're starting at that viewpoint and that's your optic, uh, it's very difficult to see what's actually wrong. And just in this little illustration here, you know, the signal to noise ratio, I think we often see uh, is very skewed because you're looking at the, the, the YAML, you're looking at the logs, you then got your observability on top, and then you might even have something coming out at the, uh, the Linux kernel uh, D message level. So there's a lot of different places we're expected to, to look, and there's a couple of um, second order problems there. The people who know how to do this stuff crystallize that knowledge in their head and get really good at it, and they accrete that knowledge, and over time, they get more valuable. But the delta between their knowledge and a junior becomes even larger, and this chasm um, is, is almost insurmountable because you have 20 years of sysadmin knowledge uh, on top of the Kate's knowledge that you're applying to the problem. So that was one of the areas that was, that was really difficult to surmount. Also, a lot of Kate's issues, I would probably wager 90 odd percent of Kate's issues are effectively Linux issues. I, issues. I used to work um, at Canonical, you know, uh, who, who build the Ubuntu operating system and many times I'd find them looking at Ubuntu rather than actually looking at Kate's. For example, you know, uh, U limits, any kind of system CTL uh, configuration, uh, even IP table rules could often be a problem, as well as systemd itself. I just love this GIF, so I, I thought I'd put it in there. Uh, but, but effectively, what I'm trying to take, emphasize here is that Kate's debugging is getting harder and harder, especially with virtualization, right? When you have a hypervisor layer on top, we're talking about things like GPU acceleration, um, and there's a lot of intrinsic knowledge there. For example, if you're using CUDA, MIG, vGPU, uh, even if you're doing network accelerator, uh, acceleration as well on a smart NIC, there's an enormous amount of context you need to have to debug that particular problem. So here's, here's sort of where we are in terms of what I think are the really big challenges with Kate's debugging. That top one, the amorphous n-dimensional layers, effectively means the complexity of Kubernetes is not linear because every time something whacks something on top, it comes with its own state of the world. So, for example, whether you're using Backstage, Argo, whether you're using uh, an operator, they're all at odds with the modus operandi for Kate. So now adding a new set of things that could break, a new set of things that can break in new interesting ways with their own dependencies. We've also got tacit knowledge formed, right? So you've got this idea that only people who have actually worked through this before can solve it because this requires um, critical thinking that's not linear. You need to make a jump to be able to say, ah, okay, I understand that problem because I've seen it before. So that, that's an inherent challenge when you're trying to tr troubleshoot Kate's. And then in the last one, just to touch upon that again, that signal to noise ratio, as we start to move toward this world of managing 20, 30 clusters with several hundred namespaces with several thousand pods, the signal to noise ratio is incredible. If, even if you have an observability vendor, you're drinking from the fire hose looking at events, you're purely relying on alarms to, to help you to, de to debug before you then have to jump in to look at the, the analysis of metrics and whatnot. So it's challenging. So this is where I kind of was inspired. You know, I was really keen to take back the power in terms of it's getting out of hand. And this is, this is my really poor attempt at building GIFs here. Um, and what I thought was interesting was, look, we have an opportunity here. There are a bunch of APIs that are becoming available. How can we leverage those to solve some of these problems? So if you don't know Kate's GPT, and I assume most people probably don't, I'm just gonna run you through it very quickly, right? So effectively, what it enables you to do is to uh, intelligently aggregate different types of signal and to return responses on those signals. It has a bunch of different analysis capabilities that are built into it, and it runs as both a CLI and an operator. So you could run it in your CI CD pipeline as a, C as a CLI, or you could run it continuously as an operator. It produces either CRDs or JSON or whatever you like really to, to um, spit out the reports. You can also see there it can categorize CVEs based on their priority. 
So in the beginning, when I thought about this, this was probably last April, prior to, prior to the KubeCon then, I was trying to figure out what should it integrate with. I, I was familiar with Hugging Face, and I'd played with some of the generators, but I, I'm not an AI ML expert, as you, you might, have, uh, might have gleaned. So I looked to OpenAI, because they had a public API, and I thought, right, let, let's start there. So we built an inference API. The two of us at this point in time had roped a friend into to helping me. And we had some really cool results. So we had a pod analyzer. We could scan the state of pods. We could compress down the events and create a context window with some relevant prompt data. Soon after, we, uh, Atore, a, a, a colleague and friend from Spectra Cloud, uh, built out local AI, which was a C++ wrapper for inference. And this was really interesting because he was able to go off and build interesting projects with KHGPT and local AI. And that created a natural community, one that I wasn't really aware of at the time, but I kind of looked at it and, and moved on. After this came an Azure integration that was submitted by the community. That's not such a big deal because the Azure integration was effectively the open AI, uh, API, but hosted by uh, Azure. After that, we got a Cohere integration, and that was really cool because I think this is about June time. We were working with several key contributors. We were having a great time building up functionality, and it was, this was an inflection point where we started to see people outside of our immediate community want to contribute a backend. After that came Bedrock, and today comes SageMaker. So all of these things now integrate in a first-party way with KHGPT, and this is pretty cool because the project only got built about five months ago. So how does it actually work? I've explained it, I've kind of bigged it up, and I make it sound uh, very grandiose. And I saw this picture on Twitter the other day, and I thought it was kind of funny. This is just a remark towards what OpenAI has now said they're going to do to companies that are building on top of their platform. So it's not a GPT wrapper, right? It doesn't run in a window in Electron and, and, and just call OpenAI. The way it actually works is there are a set of analyzers. I think there are 13 or 15 in total now. Uh, it's all based in Golang, it's all publicly available. These analyzers are just codified SRE knowledge. There's nothing magical behind it. I actually wrote part of this code when I was still an S a practicing SRE, trying to train up my team. This is unit testable as well, because you can mock out the Kubernetes API. You can see here that we're simply looking to see if an ingress class exists. This is packaged in a fairly neat way. This isn't particularly full of context, but what I'm trying to emphasize here is that there's no magic behind it. The magic happens when you actually pass the correct type of context and explain to the uh, inference API that what you actually want back isn't, isn't kind of a guess, but just to repackage the English or the language that you choose so that the user can understand it in a more meaningful way. And I think that's an important differentiation from what a lot of people are doing with generative AI. I think they're, they're, they're asking it to guess on things that it doesn't necessarily hold subject matter expertise on. But what it is very good at is linguistics. It, you know, it's built on NLP. So if we've got a complex error message, let's leverage that to make it a bit simpler. Again, you can see that this is part of the Cohere client. There's no magic here other than we're sending these things off and returning back a simplified version of the message. So probably that takes away a little bit of the magic there. But let's see what it actually looks like under the hood. Effectively, you have an analyzer. I've picked the pod analyzer right here. That pod analyzer interacts with the API server either directly through proxy, um, and it has a few other modes as well. Effectively, what it does is it picks up different events of various types. It looks at pod statuses, pod health, and then it will bundle those into a set of pre-analysis results. The pre-analysis results will then go through the API provider parser so that it can then effectively build out what we call um, a sort of a result analysis. And that enriches those results and comes back again. What's interesting as well is that we've built this capability so that you can now start to cache those results based on a key so that different API providers might give you back different results. And you can see all of those different types of results, whether it's Bedrock, whether it's Cohere, OpenAI, you can start to build a broader opinion on what the best way to triage a problem is. And so this very quick ability to switch between AI providers is a superpower in itself. I also mentioned that we have a Kate GPT deployment Again, you just deploy this into your local cluster or remote cluster, and it provides you custom resources. So you can see here, the operator will be running continuously, and it produces these custom resource definitions, sorry, custom resources rather, and you can then link those into your pipeline. They show up in Argo CD, which is quite cool as well, so you can see the relationship between KHGPT and the custom resources. And they can hold anything from errors to CVEs to any other findings that it picks up in the cluster. 
What we're seeing now is that people are starting to use KHGPT in an even more unknown way. Bit of a bit of reverberation, I apologize. We're starting to see it used in an even more unknown way, and that is starting to use it in active training, where you combine two clusters together, typically using uh, Kubeflow, where Langchain will be feeding in hyperparameter tuning and then serving back into the KHGPT deployment. This was originally done using local AI, but having now brought this to Kubeflow, we're seeing that those workflows are starting to now give us the capability to do um, fine tuning on top of the existing model being used in the cluster. I'll talk a bit more about this later on because it's quite interesting to actually think about what type of models are supported locally. And I think what's also interesting about that is you're starting to answer some of these ethical questions that will come up about in a moment. So if you're interested in the project, I just wanted to call out some sort of key metrics here. We have three different production uh, use cases actively on at the moment. We have uh, a community of over 30 key contributors. Uh, and we've, I think we're something like, as I say, 13 to 15 analyzers with over five different backend providers. So check it out, see what you think. And as I say, we're moving towards a model of trying to toe the line and delicately walk between security, privacy, but usefulness and application. So let's go to a demo and actually see what it's all about. Okay, so here's my screen. I'm just gonna show you very quickly what my Kubernetes cluster is running. I've got 36 or so pods. I have a bunch of different um, arbitrary programs that I've written. I've got some stuff that might look familiar as well. Your first experience of KHGPT is probably going to be looking at the auth list, which gives you a kind of view on what are the local providers that you can use. Secondarily to that, you might want to see what kind of filters are available. Oops. So here you can see all the different types of resource that we scan at the moment and can make insights on. This is kind of interesting as well because we have an integration with uh, tools like Trivi that can bring their own custom resource definitions into the, into the cluster, but also into the scan analysis. So let's go ahead and just have a look and analyze without any kind of uh, AI enrichment. This is really key for me, was that you should be able to get value out of this even if you aren't connecting it to the uh, AI backends. So what this is effectively doing is aggregating and simplifying pretty well-known problems in this cluster. When you apply the dash E command, it will actually package these up. It was pretty quick there because I've cached some of this, uh, this, these responses. So you can see we're immediately giving um, some, some ideas towards how do you simplify this? How do you then uh, go about debugging and triaging it? Now, I'll come on to some of the, fa the fallacies and some of the shortcomings later on. But immediately, one of the things that this is um, exciting for is because if you're not a systems uh, admin, or you're not an expert, and you've only been doing this a few years, this immediately gives you a window or at least a path to try and follow to debug. And so we're finding that a lot of the users of this tool are people who are learning Kubernetes for the first time, and they kind of have this side by side, right? They, they literally, they install K, uh, Kind, they're doing a KHGBT analyze, they're, they're building their, their VS Code uh, deployment, putting it out there, and they're running it kind of in, in, that, uh, in that flywheel. So that's quite cool to see. So, so what we can then do is we can um, start to think about taking, you know, processing it in different ways. We can put it into JSON. But I think what would be quite cool uh, for this group to look at is if we actually look at one of the error messages in particular, you can see that uh, we've got things such as container back off. And immediately, because we're passing a very well-defined uh, window of context, uh, this is a pod that actually exists in the cluster. And we can go have a look at what's going on. So again, if I go to look at my foo, we can see that again, it gave me um, the correct name of that pod, and we can go off and see what's going on. Equally, if we want to do some security scanning, um, we can go integration list, we can turn on something like the Trivi integration. Now you've got a couple options here. This can either um, go fetch Trivi and install it into the cluster, uh, or you can use an existing integration. We're also planning to build out a, a pre Prometheus integration, and the interfaces are pretty simple as well. What's interesting about this is that what you'll see also happens is in my filter list, I now get this new vulnerability report integration. That's an analyzer that gets pulled in by the integration and it knows how to categorize CVEs based on um, what, their, what their priority is in terms of their severity. This is just an example of where you can start to bring additional functionality into the tooling. 
we start to think about other things as well, like having web service specific integrations. So if you're running on Azure or uh, if you're running on uh, EKS, you could see some, some specific stuff to that platform. I'll just end this by showing you when we actually go back to the cluster and we can see that some scans are being run. Let's go and see if we get any difference in our analysis. So I just do another analyze command. It's always good when it's live because you never know how long it's going to take. Um, at this point in time, you can see that we've got some configuration issues being found and we can see the severity as medium. And so even though this is fairly raw, we're starting to be able to reduce that signal to noise for the user. And hopefully as we evolve this as a, as a project, it, we're going to improve the relevancy and make it so that there's a bit of a gilded path to fix things for people as they go along. So I want to just recap there on how is this actually useful? Like what's, what's, what's the, 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 the thing that um, I think is like the USP here? So firstly, it's faster debugging times, right? You, as, a, as an SRE, as a sysadmin, whatever you might be, uh, you can debug quickly and you can solve those issues by looking at stuff that's come up before and seeing it codified. Codifying that knowledge is a really integral part of it because you can add your own analyzers as well. People can contribute those from the community saying, hey, you missed an analyzer for persistent volume claims where they're unattached and we see it all the time, it's a waste of time. So people can contribute that and they have. Also a consistency of diagnostics. So actually having a repetitive process that can be tried several times in a row makes it um, far easier to get to the root cause if you're analyzing it in the same way each time. And finally, lowering the bar for operators, making it a little bit easier to be effective as I said, sysadmins and uh, other operators with a lot of experience, that might be great, but for people who are just learning this stuff, it's a really helpful thing to have. So you might be asking yourself, you know, why about, why don't you, what about scanning logs? What about metrics? What about all of these other pieces of the puzzle that we haven't described yet in Kubernetes? Well, that's where you get to this sort of ethical dilemma of what should I do to increase value and usefulness versus what's going to open up uh, a lot of existential problems. These are, some of the, um, these are some of the key issues we see on GitHub that come up time and time again. You know, due diligence around provenance of model data, uh, accountability, who owns my information is another good one, uh, as well as how can we make sure that things isn't, aren't poisoned. If you, if you were to try and summarize that, I think a lot of it comes around, uh, sort of, you know, tiptoes around security, privacy, uh, and perhaps ownership. So I want to go back and look at one of, the, one of the integrations because this was sort of our immediate answer to it. And you know, kudos to the project. This is another open source um, project on GitHub. And what's really great is that it supports a bunch of different models, right? Whether it's GTP4, whether it's uh, you know, Llama. Um, what's nice about local AI is that this was our immediate solution to say, ah, well, if you don't want to run your code through, um, through, through open AI, try this. And so that's what we recommended. Um, this was the initial kind of architecture for that. We had people who would run a local AI deployment in the cluster. They would then serve uh, through this endpoint here and the KHGPT deployment would pick it up and we had some pretty good success early on. Of course, as you might know, serving that endpoint is kind of heavy, especially in a small you know, edge cluster or something that doesn't have uh, a lot of oomph behind it. Equally, in the storage layer, having these models locally isn't for everyone. So I wanted to make sure there was another solution that was uh, adequate that kind of overcame some of these hurdles. Just about the same time, Titan came out. And Titan uh, is basically a, a catalog of high quality foundational models. What's really interesting about Titan is that it's starting to put filters in front of the models so that you can, it has this thing called AI responsibility so that um, there are certain things it won't return to you and there's certain data it will scrub. And this is appealing to some companies and individuals because they can control the kind of things that the model uh, is likely to respond with. And finally, it has fine tuning built in. And that was something that I think we'd been missing early on. In, these, in this interaction with OpenAI, I'd always felt somewhat frustrated. The only variable I could change was the temperature or the top K. So with that sort of in mind, we, we came back to the community and said, look, we've got OpenAI, we've got, open AI, we've got local AI, and there's still a lot of people who are really curious about, well, how can we actually start to anonymize our data? How can we start to uh, tokenize that data so that it's not so obvious what bank I work at or what, what uh, particular application I have? 
In response, we added anonymity into the API. Uh, and so you'll see just from this little code snippet, there's a, a masking process that allows you to tokenize your, um, your prompts and the responses that come back, and then it uh, unobfuscates them and prints them so that you can then act on them with the knowledge that there's not been too much data leakage there. It's not a perfect system, mind you, but it certainly moves closer towards that ask. I just want to post this um, last slide with a few different statements there because these things might look a bit unfamiliar if you've not worked in AIML, but um, you know, this is the one I think many of us have seen, right? And this effectively temperature uh, is a control on how creative the responses from the model are. And so again, one of our advice uh, pieces to the community was to modify uh, the, the sample size and the temperature of your model. But again, we were learning what the community were looking for. And many people who started using CaseGPT in the early days were saying that OpenAI had a lot of hallucinations on particular types of analyzers. If you think about it, the corpus of data inside of OpenAI is about uh, three years out of date. So Gateway API, for example, wouldn't be in there if you wrote an analyzer. And this is where you'd have to start thinking about custom training or to have a model that was slightly more up to date. So I'm trying to illustrate again that it wasn't that we had all the answers, is that we were, we were attempting to rally around some pretty existential issues that were starting to crop up quite quickly in the project. When we look at the project as a whole and where we're taking it, there are things that we haven't solved, and I'll be very clear about that, right? I'm not entirely sure who is accountable for auto-remediation um, if there's a failure or if there's a, some sort of data breach or vulnerability. Obviously, it sounds like the person who installed it on the cluster, but then is it somebody who is responsible for the model catalog? Is it the operator that enabled it? We also look at things like, should we be going more down the route of task-specific AI rather than LLMs? LLMs are appealing to us because we can get them off the shelf from you know, places like Hugging Face, but really we're going to have to rely on the quality of training and data. And I think that's something that's going to hinder us, quite honestly. So I took this, it took this to heart, and this is also one of the reasons behind why we have so many other back-end providers. Titan is one example, but there are other companies like Anthropic with Claude who are trying to also solve this by building high-quality API, um, sorry, AI. One of the criticisms you often see on the news is that um, a lot of these LLMs were trained on public information that not, doesn't necessarily have the, the right to, to draw upon. And so I think many companies are now reevaluating that. Mind you, it does cost a lot of money and take a long time. So there's some big questions that are still open. This kind of is where I wanted to get to in the last few minutes, is that we're entering this period of time where we don't really have the answers for everything. I think that this was summarized quite well. Um, I was looking at the UNESCO website around AI ethics just before this talk, and I thought that uh, Gabriella really succinctly kind of put the world to rights in this, in, this, in this passage here. But this bit I thought was pretty scary, is that the world is set to change pace, not seen since the deployment of printing press. I think that from everything I've taken away here at KubeCon, we're focusing very much on the initial feedback loop of AI models of inference. As I said at the start of this talk, there are already projects um, such as Langchain, such as uh, GPT Agent, that are looking at modifying the output of prompts. So you're going to get several layers of recursion that are occurring. And at that point, the abstraction layer becomes so complex, it's very difficult for humans to intervene. And so I'm trying to be very thoughtful about what we do and don't decide to do with CaseGPT. One of the early suggestions and options was that we could actually enable auto-remediation in the cluster. It's not that difficult to do because um, several of the major inference APIs take functions uh, as a prompt and can return to you the, the output of those functions. So there is a way to programmatically get there. But should we do a thing, that's up for debate. So I think what we really need to do as a collective is to come together to bridge the gap between the AI ML data scientist world and folks in the uh, AI and Data LF Foundation and the Cloud Native Computing Foundation and all the projects that are within. We have a great amount of opportunity, specifically with Kubernetes, to proliferate these projects very, very quickly. But back to that Pandora's box photograph at the beginning, sorry, illustration at the beginning of the talk, I think that once we do that, it's going to be almost um, impossible to pull it back in. You know, you think about suddenly there are Helm charts that you can install an operator with an LLM packaged into it. I was just in a conversation yesterday um, about actually making LLMs into OCI artifacts. That gets you to the point where you can't 
control the distribution anymore because they'll be in the wild. So trying to counter this um, kind of gap of, uh, I, 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 guess, I guess, thought leadership and trying to bring people together, I proposed um, this tag a while ago. And I'm really happy to say that there's been some amazing people who have stepped up and, and helped us to build this into a, into a working group. And this is a call to action here um, that we're, we're spinning up a working group for artificial intelligence. And that's our Slack, sorry, my, my searchlight there didn't go very well. Um, and I would really invite you to come and share your thoughts. You might be far more knowledgeable than myself on the subject. You might just be starting out. But in every walk of life within the uh, underlying substrate of technology, you'll find that you're influenced or at least can have some thoughts on the subject. I also wanted to just share that we ran the first AI Hub meeting yesterday, an unconference, and there were some great sessions. You can see, probably maybe not at the back, but people were asking questions about how do you auto scale LLMs on Kates? How do you build AI for products? Um, how do you train across ge different geographic locations? There are more questions than there are answers at this point in time. And so I think what would be really powerful is if we can come together as a community to answer some of those. In terms of the future, what do I see it holding for the Kates GPT project? Um, well, I'm going to try and answer some of those ethical questions, but I think one of the speakers in the keynotes this morning quoted Solomon Hikes with regards to, uh, you know, no is temporary and yes is forever. Uh, it's very much the case, uh, the case with Kates GPT is that I want to take it slowly and make sure we're thoughtful and provide value. If all the AI backends were turned off tomorrow, the project still needs to have value. So what I want to do is to uh, try and get this uh, accepted into the CNCF sandbox because I'm not a company, I can't maintain it on my own, right? And so what's great about this process, as you may or may not know, is that you get access to a lot of contributors, maintainers, and community, but it also sets the bar. I have to prove that it's an active project. And so we've been trying to work towards this over the past few months, and I'm happy to say we're getting really close to that, I feel, and uh, the AI working group will be certainly a part um, of that process. But aside from that, I couldn't not scratch the itch uh, of trying to do full auto remediation by closing the loop. And so I started a project recently, which has um, started to yield some pretty exciting results. This project uh, is effectively only for AWS because I needed a model that didn't hallucinate, at least to the level where I couldn't, um, where I could rely on. What this project is starting to show is that if you connect the model um, to something like AWS SDK and you can rely on the data source inside the model and you start to apply those changes, you can create a full feedback loop. And so what we're seeing is that um, this is potentially going to be the future direction of a lot of DevOps tooling where we're starting to trust the outputs if we can trust the inputs to the model. Isotope is very much in its alpha phase. I would invite you to um, come and take a look at it. I, I was a little bit obsessed with Starship Troopers when I was making this, I apologize. But it, 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 please, uh, there's a QR code. The, the code is all in Rust. Um, it's it's, it's pretty, pretty quick. It's uh, pretty straightforward. But what we're seeing already is, as I said, this is yielding some interesting outcomes. For example, when you have a public S3 bucket, you run this, it, it makes it private. When you have um, an SNS queue that's failed, you run this, it fixes the queue. It's scary where it's going to, right? And so I think that's also where this idea of thoughtfulness uh, and making sure that we're thinking uh, long and hard about the capabilities we're introducing is important. So that said, I wanted to thank you for your time and your patience. And I would invite you to think about artificial intelligence inside the CNCF and bringing communities together. If you have any questions, please let me know and get involved in the projects. Thank you.